Um, first of all, I'm just, I'll introduce myself. I'm Regina Jorgensen. I'm the Director of Astronomy here at the Mariah Mitchell Association. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's um, Winter Science Speaker Series. Um, and before we begin, I'll just make a really quick note. You, can, you should be able to see on your screen about our upcoming talks. We're doing this series um, every other Wednesday um, for, the, for the next couple of months. And we're featuring former Mariah Mitchell Association Mariah Mitchell Association interns. So it's very exciting for all of us to bring back um, some of our own and actually hear what they've been up to uh, in the last few years. So you can see on the screen um, our upcoming talks um, and I encourage you to uh, register for those and check those out um, as they come along. Um, and the other thing I'll just note um, how we're going to work tonight if you, um, we very much encourage you to ask questions. So I would um, draw your attention to the Q&A function, which you should find um, either down at the bottom or at the top of your screen. And you can just um, type your questions in there. I'll be monitoring and we will um, do the questions at the end. Um, unless there's something very kind of clarifying and urgent, we might interrupt, but we'll take, plan to take most of the questions at the end. But go ahead and type them in as they come to you and we will try to cover all of them at the end of the talk. Um, and so with that, I would just like to say it's my really, really great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Tanvir Karim. I first met Tanvir about five years ago <laughs> um, when he won a place in our highly selective um, NSF REU internship here at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. And he was actually part of the first cohort that I worked with um, as I had just started as director in this job. So a very special cohort, cohort of students um, to me personally. And um, he set the bar very high for future REU students, I have to say, with everything that he accomplished while he was here. Um, he immediately impressed with his research skills and um, the summer project that he actually worked on um, studying these extended structures of the Milky Way called the Fermi Bubbles. Um, it was so successful that he went on to lead and publish a first author paper in the Astrophysical Journal called the Probing the Southern Fermi Bubble in Ultraviolet Absorption Using Distant AGNs. And as actually he's just told me now has had two more papers um, uh, along with that same topic in recent years. Um, Tanvir also really shone during our public open nights at the observatory. If you were lucky enough to come visit during that summer, you probably heard a constellation tour given by Tanvir as he kind of took that over as his task for the open nights and did just an amazing job um, giving constellation tours, telling the stories about the various constellations and different um, stories about them in different cultures and really could just enthrall the audience um, of about 100 people standing on the deck with the great stories. And we got so much great feedback about his constellation tours. It was really a fantastically fun summer. Um, Tanvir earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester and is currently in his fourth year of his PhD at Harvard University. He has won many, many awards and accolades in his career, um, most notably a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship, uh, which are kind of the most prestigious and competitive fellowships to get. So that was very high achievement, um, as well as a Goldwater Scholarship, um, which is awarded to a very few select students who show exceptional promise in STEM fields. And I'll just wrap up by noting that in addition to many other interests and talents, Tanvir is also passionate about languages and speaks four languages fluently, including Russian, which uh, I have a very fond memory of um, our former director, Vladimir, who is, of course, from Russia, coming to visit and Tanvir breaking out into Russian and then having a conversation in Russian to the delight of Vladimir, of course. Um, so it was, it was a really fun summer and we don't do just astronomy around here. We do lots of other things. Um, and Tanvir is a great example of that. And so with that, I'm really happy to turn the floor over um, to Tanvir. And again, I'll just remind you if you've just logged on, um, I encourage you to ask questions and go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we will get to them at the end of the talk. So take it away, Tanvir. Well, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Regina. Um, I'm very excited to come back uh, to Mariah Mitchell again, albeit in a virtual setting, but hopefully 
uh, now that I am, I've been living in Boston for the last uh, uh, three and a half years now, hopefully I'll get a chance to visit soon, like once uh, things get better. So uh, I will just uh, share my screen and just check with you real quick that you're able to uh, see the, uh, the slides. Yes, we see them. Okay, great. So um, hi everyone. Uh, I am Tanvir. Um, I am currently, as Regina mentioned, a fourth year graduate student at Harvard, uh, where I am getting my uh, PhD in astrophysics. And today I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, unveiling the universe with spectroscopy and big data. So essentially what my dissertation work uh, has been going on at Harvard for the last three and a half years. So um, before I go and jump into the science aspect of things, I really do have to, again, thank Mariah Mitchell for the opportunity, not only for today, but also like five years ago when I was accepted as an intern, uh, because it really gave me the confidence and gave me the ability to think that, yes, I can go to grad school, I can do good research. And I just wanted to share like some of my fond memories with everyone. So this was uh, picture with the all the other uh, astro interns like during the soiree, uh, but we not only had fun with like the uh, the as we would call ourselves the astro turns like we were not only just going out and observing uh, late night, but we also had a lot of fun with all the other interns who were also uh, staying over that summer, and at the same time during those events, um, I uh, was able to further harness my interest in astrophotography. So this was like one picture I took uh, from Loin's Observatory and you see me in the foreground and see the center of the Milky Way uh, on, the, on the sky. And so like it was just overall a great summer and a great experience. So I'm just very happy and delighted to come back again. So uh, to jump into the, the conversation topic for today, uh, really the idea of studying the universe comes from the subfield that we nowadays call cosmology. And so the question uh, that I sometimes get is what is cosmology or like how does it differ from astrophysics or astronomy? So it really kind of depends on who you ask this question. So if you um, ask a philosopher, that person might say that it is a branch of metaphysics, which discusses the ultimate philosophical problems relating to the existence of our universe. And so while nowadays cosmology is something we see as uh, something that is more scientific or related to physics, it was not the case uh, back uh, way, way before, because people have been asking this question for a really long time, that where do we come from and what how do we make sense of everything that we see in the universe? So it started off, cosmology started off as a religious question in, in many sense and across different cultures where, for example, here you see like what Dante thought the cosmology of the universe would look like, like how the, there are different layers uh, in, in the world that we live in. And then there are also lots of like really interesting art. Like this is uh, one of like Flammarion's engraving from 1888. And I find this picture to be very, this, this motif to be very inspiring uh, as an astronomer because you see this person uh, who I suppose is supposed to be some form of scientist slash cosmologist and who is sort of like at the very edge of knowledge represented by this uh, sphere where we have the stars and he is able to penetrate beyond that and like look beyond what is there. And I think it is sort of that, although the, the idea of what cosmology has changed, what, inspired, what has inspired cosmologists back then and what inspires cosmologists now is still the same is trying to understand and make sense of like where we are and uh, how the universe works. And this question, of course, is not only, uh, you know, an exclusive thing that was asked in the Western canon, but we also see uh, in, in Chinese mythology, in Indian mythology, in Mesoamerican mythology, people trying to make sense of what is the world and what is the universe and what to make of it. So with that little bit of background, um, I think by now I have been able to convince you that yes, uh, cosmology is something that has been driving people uh, to ask these questions for a really long time. So jumping from uh, these mythological uh, eras and like the, the, the really early times, 
we jump into what we call physical cosmology nowadays, which is much more related to using physics and using the scientific method to understand and answer these same questions. And this really sort of started with um, Albert Einstein. I feel like if you go to any physics talks, chances are that you will probably see his picture because to, more often than not, like he was probably very influential in making a contribution in like uh, many of the fields uh, that, uh, that are the current sub branches of, of physics. So his biggest contribution to this question was coming up with the idea of general relativity. In other words, how do matter uh, talk to each other with this thing called gravity? So gravity or gravitation is something that we all understand that if you have matter, they feel this attractive force. And he was a person who, will, who tried to make sense of like what that truly means. And um, I won't really get into too much about like what this equation stands for, uh, but I just wanted to put it there because in some sense, like this is the primary equation that cosmologists sort of like look to like for, for inspiration or for when we are trying to like figure out like what can we predict and how do we measure things in our universe. And although I've never, uh, thought about like getting a tattoo, I suppose like if there is a thing that is closest to ever convincing me, it would be this equation because I think that is so fundamental uh, to cosmology today. And I also wanted to draw a little bit of attention to the person on the right, uh, who is uh, George Lemaitre, uh, who was another cosmologist who introduced this notion of Big Bang. So while uh, we have on one hand, Albert Einstein coming and introducing us to gravitation, uh, 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 what we think to be a complete theory of gravity. We also have this other person who comes in and says, you know what, the universe had a beginning and it probably started off as this like really dense primeval atom, which then for some reason started to expand and that gave rise to everything that we see today. So while these theoretical exercises were going on back in the early 20th century, the question remained is that, well, cosmology is something that still at that point was something that philosophers used to think about. Maybe if you uh, were a priest, you would think about like what is our role in this universe? And then slowly the theoretical physicists were starting to ask this question too. But like anything in science, you need evidence, you need proof. So until we were able to actually start observing things, there, the, anyone could say anything like Big Bang versus no Big Bang, and there was no really way to prove who was right and who was wrong. And this is sort of like where really like modern day cosmology slowly starts to take shape. And so this starts off with Hubble, uh, with his famous experiment. So what Hubble did was, he observed how fast the 25 nearest galaxies to our own, the Milky Way, uh, how fast they're moving. And he noticed a very peculiar uh, relationship, which is shown in this plot. So on the X, we have distance and on the Y axis, we have velocity. So things that are farther away from us seem to go away faster from us. So the farther you look, the, far, the faster that thing is moving away from us. So from this, like this was like one of the, the big like smoking gun uh, experiments, if you will, uh, in proving that perhaps Big Bang was the way the universe started. Because if everything is moving away from everything, that means at some point, probably these things were closer to each other. And so when you do that extrapolation, then you can sort of like start to make that connection between Big Bang and this. And of course, the person I show um, in the bottom right uh, is uh, uh, Henry Levietta, uh, who was uh, a computer at where I work currently, which is the Harvard College Observatory. So back then you didn't have like digital or mechanical computers. So what the astronomers, which was a completely male dominated field, what they would do is hire uh, really smart women who knew how to do arithmetic and like mathematical calculation very quickly. And they would come and compute. Therefore they were the computers uh, of, of that, uh, of those days. And although their job was relegated to being like uh, human calculators, nevertheless, she contributed fundamentally to our understanding of how, uh, the, like how uh, certain types of stars called Cepheids uh, behave, which 
is the was the linchpin through which Hubble was ultimately able to make this measurement. So I think it's important that we talk about contribution, like not from only the, the famous people, but also uh, the work that has so long been neglected by many in our field. So with like Hubble's idea and showing like Big Bang is the way that the universe works, uh, like there was like steady progress as so I'm like jumping from the 1920s right into 1998. So there is a big gap in the middle uh, just to save time. But during that time, uh, we started to have this notion of, okay, like uh, that, okay, probably by this point, we have convinced ourselves that Big Bang is the way the universe has started. Uh, and at the same time, we started thinking about, like we started getting hints of this mysterious thing called dark matter which we uh, say consists of most of the matter substance in the universe. Uh, so these two things were sort of like making, uh, like establishing themselves in uh, physics very strongly. Uh, but around that time in 1998, this supernovae experiment comes in. So the idea behind this experiment, which was done by Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt and Adam Rees was very simple. Uh, their idea was, okay, let's say that, you know, like we, we agree that Big Bang started uh, the universe that happened. So you have like matter starting from like uh, matter going away from each other. But ultimately we know that gravity is the only force that works at the very large scale. So if you have like matter like going away from each other, you should probably like reach, you know, a point uh, around which the gravitational attractions would win over. And then you should be able to see that, you know, like galaxies are sl like slowing down and perhaps even you might be seeing that the farthest galaxies are actually coming back towards us. And in the nineties, this was a very famous model as to what is the ultimate fate of our universe that there might be something called the big crunch is that like we have big bang, things expand and then ultimately gravity wins over and then things come back and then you like go back to being what things were like 13 billion years ago. Curiously, uh, what they found was that not only were the galaxies farther away from us moving away, but they were moving away at an accelerating speed, uh, an accelerating rate. So what that meant is that like there was something that was just pushing things farther away even farther from us, and that did not really make any sense. So the way they were able to do this was using this, uh, using supernovae, which are really bright uh, stars, uh, uh, whose brightness we know beforehand. So they use this thing as what we call a standard candle. So the idea is that, you know, like if you take a candle and you know what its brightness is, uh, it, the farther you take it away from you, the dimmer it looks. So by observing supernovae and what their brightness looks, uh, looks like to us, we can then compare that apparent brightness to the actual brightness that we can calculate like from some other uh, physical model. And we can use those two numbers to directly get how far the supernovae are from us. And they use that technique to figure out that the universe was expanding at an accelerating rate for which they got the Nobel Prize uh, back in uh, 2011. And this discovery puzzled everyone because it made no sense. There was no indication as to why such a thing should exist. However, um, we then started calling this thing as dark energy, which is the sort of this mysterious fifth force that act as an anti-gravity and act as a gravity repellent and is supposedly present everywhere, which is causing things to move, move away from each other. So, uh, then, like with this idea of dark energy, uh, dark matter, and Big Bang, we come into the era what we call the concordance model of the universe, which in other words means is that this is the most accepted model because it seems like if you look at the pie chart on the right hand side, that if we say that there is the universe is consists of 74% dark energy, 22% dark matter, and only 4% of all visible things. So that means you, me, and all the pretty pictures of all the galaxies and all the stars you see in the universe, they form only 4%. And the 96% uh, 
of the universe is something that we just have no idea of. But somehow this model is able to explain how our universe functions better than anything else. So I saw this like joke on this like very uh, popular uh, comic uh, series from XKCD where, you know, like they were trying to like also ask this question, like what is uh, dark matter and dark energy? So I guess like to, to some people it might seem like, yeah, like it, it, the explanation could come from anywhere and, and anything really. So um, the, the, the next thing that we uh, want to then start thinking about is okay, well, you're telling me that there is 74% of the universe is dark energy, 27% is dark matter, but how do you know that's true? Like how, how do you uh, make claims, like such grandiose claims about things that you don't even understand? So really like what we do in cosmology and in modern day cosmology is trying to understand this, uh, I try to understand this one principal thing, which is, how is matter distributed across the universe? So this is a, on the right-hand side, you see a very nice, pretty picture, but this is a simulation. So this is, a, this is based on how we think the universe looks like, which shows you that, uh, that matter is distributed like some filamentary web. So we call this the cosmic web. And the idea is, well, what do we know uh, controls matter at the largest scale? Well, it's gravity or gravitation and it comes from Einstein's prescription of general relativity. So if you believe that general relativity is the way that matter is supposed to behave in the whole universe, well, in that case, you can then try to study how matter is spread out. And then based on that distribution, we can start to say things about whether one model is better than the other. Uh, so this idea seems to work pretty well for the most part. However, uh, what it, it turns out that there are some other ways in which these models are not really able to explain everything that is going on. So here I show you two such examples. So when we are do we're studying this distribution of matter in the universe, what we are really doing is we are trying to uh, because you know like you have a lot of matter uh, so just trying to like capture the picture of everything is practically impossible so what we do is we resort to statistics to take all of these complicated information and turn them into like simple numbers for example you know if you you if you're used to using a, a excel spreadsheet you might have like a really long column of a lot of numbers and you might uh, turn it into a mean and, a, and a, a median or standard deviation and you might go with that number because that tells you how like what the property of the data that you're looking at kind of looks like. So when we do this sort of exercise um, and there are essentially seven different parameters that describes how our universe looks like, uh, we start to see that, well, things might not actually look as nice as what we thought. So on the left-hand side, um, here you see a famous constant that's, that's used in cosmology and astrophysics, which is called the Hubble constant, named after uh, Edwin Hubble, whose picture I showed you earlier. The point of this constant is to tell us that how fast is a thing moving away from us. So the unit you will see here is kind of funny. It says kilometers per second per megaparsec. So for those who are not familiar with astronomy jargon, a megaparsec contains a million parsec and a parsec contains 3.26 light years. So this is like a very large distance, if you will. And so what this number is saying, so let's say if you were to take this number that is shown in orange uh, underlined Planck, uh, what their measurement is saying is that the universe is expanding at the rate of 67 kilometers for every megaparsec that we observe. So if a galaxy is one megaparsec away, it's, it's moving away from us at 67.4 kilometers per second. If it's at two megaparsecs and it's leaving, like receding away from us, the double the speed. What's interesting though about all of this is that like, as our technology has improved, uh, the way we measure 
like how the matter is distributed across the universe has increased. So we not only use supernovae, but we can also use the light, uh, the, the earliest light of the universe known as the cosmic microwave background. And what we start to see is that the number, for example, you see here, which is Planck. So this number is something we obtain from the earliest light in the universe. And then compare this number with uh, this, which is written as shoes. And this is the experiment where people try to measure the same number with uh, the supernovae. And these are a bunch of other experiments that uh, try to do the same thing with other things. And what you will notice is that like there's a pretty big discrepancy, like the, 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 the Planck number is all the way here, but the shoes number is all the way there. And there seems to be no overlap at all with their error bars. So this is something that's very interesting because if we live in a, in a universe that we think we understand with Einstein's relativity, then, you know, like the numbers should agree with each other. But the fact that the more we observe, the more this discrepancy grows seems to tell us that something happened at the very early universe or something happened in the very late universe, which is causing the expansion rate number, if you would, uh, to differ from each other by quite a lot. And we don't understand why that's the case. And a lot of people think that maybe the explanation is something as simple as we need to improve our measurement. But some people also say that perhaps the issue is that there is some other exciting new physics that we haven't discovered yet. And on the left side, you see a very similar thing with a different parameter, which is in, in our jargon, we call it sigma eight. But really what this tells you is that how clumped up matter is. So in other words, let's say, if I have a clump of, of matter here, uh, what is the chance that I will find like another clump of matter right over here. And when I, when I say like here and here, I'm really talking about in terms of like cosmic scales, like in megaparsec level scales, not you know in terms of our earthly scales. Uh, because the idea is that, well, uh, one model might tell you that things like matter tend to clump with each other more than others. Uh, and that gives you like one type of measurement but then again, we see that if you try to measure like how clumpy matter is, we see that some other experiments tend to give us a different answer. And so although like on broad scale, like our models agree with each other, nevertheless, we have started to see that, okay, there is probably some discrepancy rising in these different parameters that we are measuring. And if we cannot explain these things with regular physics, then the only alternative that is left for us in many cases would be to start thinking that, okay, what is beyond the physics that we understand? And that's like one of the big challenges that we are trying to resolve. So in order to do that, um, one approach that we take is by trying to like map the universe. So the idea behind this type of experiments is very simple. Remember that I, I said that in cosmology, what we are really trying to do is understand how matter is distributed across the universe because that distribution tells us whether our understanding of gravitation or understanding of Big Bang is uh, right or are there uh, areas of improvement. Well, how do you go and map the amount of matter that's in the universe? Like we can't really get on a rocket ship and go around, travel and, say that, oh, like I see the, you know, like 100 kilograms of matter here, 10,000 kilograms of matter over there. What can we use? Well, as astronomers, we can use our telescope to observe galaxies and galaxies are things that have matter. And we know that galaxies tend to live very closely uh, and like almost always surrounded by dark matter. So if you know where galaxies are, chances are that you can also then say something about how much matter uh, there is in the vicinity of that galaxy. So what we really do in this sort of experiment when we say mapping the universe is we literally go observe the sky and then we, we're essentially trying to count how many galaxies are there in say this part of the universe versus that. And that using that number, we can then start to make some claim about like how much matter is there. Because if you see more galaxies over here compared to this part, 
then we say that there is more matter here compared to this, this part of the universe. So um, as a result of this, uh, this type of experiment, uh, one, uh, one experiment that I have become involved with like ever since I started grad school is the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, otherwise known as DESI. Um, it is a spectroscopic survey, uh, which uh, I will get into a little bit later as to what I mean by a spectroscopic survey. But the really, really cool thing is that um, unlike the traditional telescopes that we have seen or might have uh, it have experience with, especially if you have been to the Loins Observatory where you might have uh, seen uh, uh, different uh, planets and stars and nebula through the, the, the 24 inch, uh, the way DESI works is a little bit different it, in that we essentially automate the entire process. And what you see over here in this picture on the bottom right are 5,000 tiny robots. And each of these robots are responsible for observing one galaxy. So imagine it's, a, it's almost as if you had 5,000 iPhone and you are pointing it at a crowd and each of those iPhones are able to take uh, the portrait image of an in, like different individuals and you are able to gather information uh, about people quickly that way. So that is how this entire like amazing like machinery works is that like th this, this uh, uh, spectrograph and this telescope system was like completed uh, last year and it has been installed. So uh, as of like last couple of months, we have been observing in the sky. And the goal is to observe 40 million objects, which will cover a third of the night sky. And we plan to cover about five gigaparsec in volume. And just to give you a sense of like what this volume means, uh, it, it, it refers to uh, if you could fit 10 to the 57 Earths uh, in that one volume. So that means 57 zeros after the number 10. So, so it's almost impossible like for humans to comprehend like how large of a volume we will be uh, probing, but that's the exciting part is that it allows us to see uh, things as far as 11 billion years ago. So this will create the most detailed map of the universe uh, to date. Um, so uh, for to uh, like this is this is also a, a major uh, collaboration which uh, consists of people from all over the world. So we have about 500 researchers from 69 different institutions coming from 13 different countries. So you could really get a sense of that, like a lot of people are very interested in coming up with answers to this question. And this is what makes uh, DESI like the next big thing in the field of cosmology. Uh, so for, for uh, time's sake, I will skip a couple of slides just to sort of like get to a couple of like the interesting things that I've been working on. But to give you the last bit of uh, orientation is that what is spectroscopy and how does it work? When you think about telescopes traditionally, we think about, you know, like you look through the telescope, you look at beautiful images. Well, in spectroscopy, what we do is instead of looking at that image, it's almost like putting a prism in front of the light that's coming from this galaxy. And we are then looking at what the spectrum looks like because if you pass, for example, white light through prism, you see the rainbow, and that's the, why rainbows uh, happen in the first place. And it's, in, it's exciting for us to look at that because depending on what color you see, like, or what color you might not see, that can be directly, uh, we can relate that back to different elements that might be present or absent in a particular galaxy. So how does this relate to uh, trying to like create a 3D map of our universe. Well, um, imagine that the, the band you see in the center is a spectra of like a, a galaxy. Now, if the galaxy is moving away from you, this whole thing will appear to shift towards the left. So you would see something that is on the top, which is what we call a red shifted galaxy. Uh, on the other hand, if you see the galaxy coming towards you, you would see it like all of these lines shifting a little bit towards the right, which was what we call blue shifting. And this is very much similar to the idea of Doppler effect, 
In other words, if you have ever been near an ambulance, if it comes towards you, the pitch is high, but as it leaves, like the, the pitch becomes uh, lower. So when it's coming towards you, the sound wave becomes blue shifted. So you hear higher intensity, but as it leaves, uh, you hear the intensity go down. And you, this phenomena is also observed with lights. So imagine that you knew like how like loud the intensity of the ambulance is as it's approaching you. If you knew the intensity, you could actually go and use a very simple formula to calculate how fast it's coming towards you versus how fast it's moving away from you. And we use the same mathematical form formula to go and measure how fast things are moving away from us. So um, the, the, the whole notion of uh, uh, DESI in that case is to go and start like measuring this redshift of, of all of these 40 million galaxies. And once you are able to do that, then you can kind of like say, okay, that galaxy is 5 billion years away from us. That galaxy is 6 billion years away from us, et cetera, et cetera. And remember that what I said earlier, that when we are looking at 40 million data points, that's a lot, right? So imagine that you have an Excel spreadsheet with 40 million rows. And if you try to like make sense of it, it might become very complicated. So we use this uh, statistical tool, uh, if you would call it, called a power spectrum. I'm not going to really try to explain like how we derive this, but the idea is it's very similar to if you have a spreadsheet with let's say a thousand rows, you could also try to calculate what the mean or the median of those columns are. And that number tells you something about like the, the number, uh, like the, the spreadsheet that you are looking at. We try to essentially do the same thing is that we take those 40 million data points and then we try to ask, on average, how far are, is one galaxy away from another? So we are trying to like figure out like what is like the typical distance between one galaxy compared to another. And this operation is what we essentially uh, call the power spectrum. And we use this because a plot like this is a much simpler thing for us to look at and analyze compared to something like that crazy uh, filamentary map that you saw earlier, because uh, that, is a, that is a more difficult thing for us to look at and make sense of what data we are looking at. So you could kind of like think of this as essentially doing that Excel operation where we are taking all that data and collapsing it into ways in which we can try to make sense of different models. And depending on what model of gravitation or what model of dark energy you believe in, this line will change. And based on that change, we can then start to say, well, it seems like that model tends to fit like all my observed data points better than the other one. So perhaps that means that that model of dark energy or that model of dark matter is a better explanation of how the universe works compared to the other. So um, using this, uh, what I'm, uh, interested in doing is looking at a very particular type of galaxy called emission line galaxies. And these galaxies uh, will form the bulk of the stuff that we will observe in DESI. Um, and, but the interesting thing is that their properties are not really well understood beyond the fact that we know that they are star forming. So these are very young galaxies. They have a lot of stars, which is why they tend to appear a lot brighter than other stars. And as a result, because they're brighter, even though they're far away from us, we are still able to observe them. And the idea is that, uh, uh, this is like from a different research, is that like as you look farther back, the star formation rate or the number of stars available in the universe goes up. So the idea is that the farther you look back, the more galaxies of this type we should be able to see. Uh, in fact, the number of galaxies, uh, as I mentioned, that we will be observing 17 million of them. Uh, let me just give you a kind of like a scale of like how many galaxies we will be seeing uh, in a small patch of the sky. So the moon is half a degree, like in area in the sky. And within the size of like the moon, we are expecting to see 1200 emission line galaxies. So that's like like 2,400 galaxies of this per square degree, which is really uh, an amazing uh, way for us to really probe the very earliest uh, universe. So 
Um, the, the research that I have been uh, working on over the past uh, couple of years is to sort of use these special type of galaxies called emission line galaxies. Uh, and these are the galaxies that are, uh, you know, like somewhere between eight to 11 billion years uh, uh, away from us, uh, uh, light years away from us. Uh, but nevertheless, in cosmic time scale, they still form galaxies that are pretty nearby. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, these, you know, like when we look at galaxies, we can count them and that tells us how, like how much matter is in one place compared to another. But there are other ways of measuring how, uh, like where matter is. And this, another way is something called the cosmic microwave background. And this is the earliest light that is visible in the universe. Um, and this is the light that is coming towards us from the universe when it was only 400,000 years old. In fact, if you have used one of those old TVs like with, uh, with like receivers and antenna, you might, have, might remember seeing static. 1% of the static that you see is actually coming from this cosmic microwave background. So in some sense, you could hear uh, the earliest universe like from your like old school TV. So um, the, the, the way that my project works is, well, you know, like I could use galaxies to study like where the matter is to make an interpretation of like how the universe works, but I could also use this very early light. Now, how does that work? Well, according to general relativity, light bends its path if it's in presence of really heavy matter. So if you have a lot of matter, then the light that is coming from this very early universe is going to bend a little bit. And this bending of light, like if it bends more, that means there was more matter present uh, between uh, like uh, the early, very early universe and us today. And by measuring this bending of light, we can also start to create a map of like how much matter there is in the universe. So what I suggested along with my advisor is that like, okay, why don't we just, you know, combine two different probes of how matter is distributed and combine them together to really understand how the, the underlying uh, matter structure is in the universe. And this is very helpful because it, allows us to like answer questions like, you know, like how clumpy is matter? Uh, and even answer questions like, oh, is Einstein correct? Like is general relativity the way that gravity works? Or is there some other explanation? Because, you know, like if gravity doesn't work the way we think it does, then the bending of light coming from the cosmic microwave will be different from what we predict. And then we can use the galaxies sort of as like a a different way of measuring the same thing and compare these two measurements. And so the way that cross-correlation really works is that I use this example quite often is that imagine that you have never uh, tasted banana and, and you know, like I am trying to convince you or try to explain to you what banana tastes like. Well, if I don't have banana, but let's say I have banana smoothie and some banana muffin uh, close to me, I can give you both of these things that have amounts of banana and I can tell you, try to figure out like what's the common taste profile between these two things. And that is what the banana tastes like. And that is in a sense, what we are doing is that we will never be able to go and really measure where matter is distributed across the universe. But what I can do is go and try to count how many galaxies are. That tells me one way of bringing, figuring out how, where matter is. And then I can also go and see how the light is bending from the very earliest universe and combine these two different information together to figure out like how truly uh, matter uh, behaves in the very largest scale in our universe. So um, on a, like a daily level, you know, like I, I gave you sort of like this like high level overview, but really like on a, on a daily basis, my work is a lot of building computational and statistical tools where uh, it a lot of times means that these uh, ideas are quite novel, so they have not been tested before. So what we do is go and actually compare them against realistic simulations. So here is a simulation you see that one of uh, the grad students in our group created where he used a trillion particles uh, and just 
like let uh, like coded gravity in and we just observed how the gravity is influencing the the evolution and the movement of these objects and uh, based on that, like I can go and then like test my code and then say, well, like my code is working or it's not working because I already know like what the underlying matter looked like in these simulations. So that it's sort of like, like, you know, looking, peeking in, comparing the answer with what my code is telling me and then trying to uh, run this thing in reality. So the last thing I will point out is that as you might have guessed by now, is that these type of work requires a lot more statistics and a lot more computational work than, uh, uh, than I initially had anticipated. So here is an example, uh, just to give you a quick sense, is that remember that what we were doing is counting the number of galaxies uh, in the sky. So, but of course, uh, you know, like you might have days when it's cloudy and you don't get to observe as much, or you might have days when the light pollution is pretty bad or some other things have affected your count. So if for some reason, let's say, uh, this is like the, what the night sky and what we will be observing. Let's say for some reason, my observing in this patch of the sky was worse than this patch, then I'm not really comparing apples to apples because I will be counting the number of galaxies fewer over here compared to galaxies that are pre present over here. And so I need to then start actually understanding what we call systematics is that I need to understand well if you have this type of like cloud coverage or this type of thing happening, then the number of galaxies that I will count will go down by this percent. So that means that I should have observed more and I need to account for that in my statistical tool set. And so we do a bunch of these uh, comparisons. And so a lot of our day-to-day -day work really revolves around like making these checks and balances and making sure that we are not introducing any personal bias when we try to like make these uh, very complicated and precise uh, calculations. So sort of like just to wrap things up and looking forward, um, you know, like it's a very exciting time to study the universe. Like as we look into the future, we will be observing, uh, we will be getting even more powerful telescopes that will be observing millions and millions of galaxies. And we have a lot of data coming in which is why you see a lot more statistics and computer science uh, interplaying with cosmology today compared to before. And this is just a, like, a, like a cute uh, cartoon. You see that back in the 1970s, we thought that there is dark matter and visible matter. In the 80s, we started thinking about some form of exotic dark matter. And in the 1990s, we, we have to go through another paradigm shift where we say that dark energy is the dominant thing in the universe. So the question now holds is that in 2020, what else we might find as these like new generation of experiments will be run and we will be able to get such high volume of data. So um, I want to um, acknowledge uh, Desi and everyone else in the collaboration for uh, like allowing me to participate and for allowing me to be a part of this very exciting research uh, over the last three and a half years. And I also thank Mariah Mitchell again for inviting me over to uh, share like some of the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I will stop uh, now and I will go ahead and accept questions. <clears throat> Yay, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Tamir. That was so exciting and so interesting. Um, and you did a, a really great job trying to explain some difficult things. Uh, we have lots of questions, actually lots of great questions. And I'll encourage um, anyone who has questions to go ahead and put them in the Q&A and we'll just start going down the list. Um, it was actually good. Um, somebody early on put a question in the chat. I'm going to go there first really quickly um, and asked um, through which experiments slash data was the pie chart based on. So you, you, you showed the pie charts again yes. in one of your final slides. So maybe you could just briefly touch on how those different pieces of the uh, pie chart were determined. Right, so um, I will uh, go back to uh, this plot real quick. So the experiment that was used, uh, we, there were two experiments, one called WMAP, the other was Planck. So these were two experiments that were observing those, like the earliest light, the relic light called the cosmic microwave background that, that is coming from when the universe was only 400 years, uh, 400,000 years old. And what they do is that like once you observe, so for example, here you see in this plot that like Planck like made some measurements 
which you see over here, like in the blue data points, in terms of like how they think that uh, matter is distributed across the universe. And then we also can then like look at this thing called the power spectrum or this, you know, like aggregated statistics. And for, let's say, if you say that there is 40% dark, dark energy in the universe, this line probably would go down a little bit. Uh, or let's say if you say that the amount of dark energy is 90%, then this line probably might get shifted towards the right or to the left. So what we are really doing is that like there are these uh, kind of like tuning parameters or like, like fine tuning like knobs, if you will, uh, like which tells you how much dark energy is there, how much matter is there. And then we go and like take, collect all this data. And then we say that for what numbers like when we fine tune these different knobs, like do we get a model that best fits or best explain all the data that we observe? And through that, we are then able to make some claim that yes, that's the percentage of dark energy, even though we don't quite understand what dark energy is in the first place. Great. Um, the next question is, uh, this may be an odd question, but what do you believe the universe is expanding into? Um, this is a concept that I think is one of the hardest, even I think for like first or second year uh, grad students to wrap their head around. I'm not entirely quite sure if I still have my head wrapped around this. Um, uh, Regina, feel free to also uh, jump in. But uh, the idea is that the universe is not really expanding into anything because the universe is space itself. So uh, in other words, uh, imagine that if I give you like a, like a chewing gum, like it's a bad analogy, but let's say I give you a chewing gum um, and I uh, like tell you to uh, like put a dot in it and I tell you to stretch it, the dot is still there, but the dot grows bigger, right? So it's not that, you know, like the dot grew into something, but the, the very act of stretching the fabric, and in this case, the fabric of space itself, like as you stretch it, it keeps growing. And so uh, in other words, like there is nothing beyond the universe, which is kind of the, I think like the, the challenging thing for us to wrap our heads around, but it intrinsically grows because, out, because beyond the universe, like there's no concept of space or time. Uh, so um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question well, but um, that is like, I, I, I think like one of like the more, uh, even like philosophically, like challenging things, uh, like you just have to accept like once you start studying cosmology. That was a great answer. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I, and then a follow-up question, how do we know the universe is expanding? And I think you touched on that a little bit in the beginning um, of your talk. If you want to briefly, briefly go for that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so let me um, try to like go back to uh this this uh, example so as i mentioned that you know like there are these supernovas that are very bright uh and we think we understand like how bright these supernovae are so all like there's a special type of supernovae that all explode with the same brightness or the same luminosity so imagine that if i give you uh like if you look at the picture on the bottom right if i tell you that oh this uh, let's say a candle or light bulb has brightness of 60 watts. So you know that it's 60 watt intrinsically. Now, let's say I take this light bulb and I move it really far away from you. Compared to you, the light will look dimmer. And from, from your perspective, you can maybe use some other fancy equipment to measure what is the wattage that you're measuring of that particular light. Let's say it's 10 watt compared to 60. So then you can like use the numbers 60 and 10. And there's a very simple like physic, physical formula that you can use that tells you that, oh, the ratio of these numbers uh, uh, act in a certain way. And from that, you can directly infer like how far a thing is. So that's what like uh, the, the cosmologists uh, using supernovae did is that they tried to measure uh, how, uh, what is the apparent brightness of these uh, supernovae or these like standard bulbs, if you would call them. And what they found is that the bulb that is really far away from us, like the, like they're very dim. So that means like they're extremely far away. 
compared to like if you were to believe that the universe is not expanding, then the brightness would be uh, much higher. So by comparing that, uh, so imagine that a person is walking away with the light bulb from you versus they're just standing there static. So like that's the analogy I would draw is like how we are able to then say that, okay, things are moving because things happen to get dimmer over time. Great. Um, the next question is, if the background light from the Big Bang appears to be coming from all directions, how can you measure how much it's bent? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, to be honest, um, so I am not a, a CMB lensing um, expert, so take my answer with a, with a grain of salt. Uh, this is not my uh, uh, matter of expertise. Uh, but the, the idea is that um, when you look at the cosmic microwave background, um, there are like different things you can measure. You can measure its temperature. Uh, then there is this other property called uh, polarization, which tells you like what is the orientation of light. And so based on um, the, like the very tiny differences in temperature. So on average, the universe looks very much the same temperature. It's 2.7 Kelvin. Um, that is the temperature. But if you look at the millikelvin level, which is like at the millionth uh, uh, order, then you see that there are like tiny discrepancies like that appear. The universe seems to have a little bit of more temperature here, a little bit of less temperature there. And there are different physical theories that tell you that, let's say, like if you have a lot of matter here, um, when the light is going around it, it can either gain energy or lose energy. And based on that, it will appear either a little bit hotter or a little bit cooler, like that part of the universe. And so by like, looking at this statistical differences in how the temperature and the, the polarization that is the direction of in which the light uh, is, is moving, like the, by combining those two, you're able to then start like making uh, guesses as to like how like matter is distributed. In other words, how, how the lensing is affecting uh, your measurement. Great. Um, I'll just note, since we're at about at eight o'clock, um, if you're okay with it, Tanvir, may, we have a couple more questions, so <laughs> I'd love to get to these. Okay, so um, feel free if you have to take off, we will be posting this um, on our YouTube channel tomorrow if you have to leave and want to catch the rest of the questions. Uh, we'll just go with some more questions, though, for a few more minutes. Um, we have a question um, that says, you mentioned weather issues for counting galaxies as one challenge. Are there objects in the universe that throw a wrench in your data collection and analysis methods? Uh, yes, um, I think the biggest wrench for cosmologists, so this is like the funny thing is for most astronomers or even for me when I was working in Mariah Mitchell, like Milky Way was the beautiful thing. Like you go out, you see it, it's amazing. For a cosmologist, it's the biggest wrench that we have to deal with because compared to the rest of the universe, because it is our galaxy, it's right up there. So when I'm trying to like calculate, like count how many galaxies, let's say are in that part of the sky, um, if the Milky Way happens to be there, it's so bright that it overpowers everything else. So um, imagine that, you know, um, I have three like 10 wattage lights and then in front of it, I hold a thousand watt light and I tell you how many lights are there. Unless there is a very clever way in which you can model like how the thousand wattage light looks like, uh, you won't even be probably able to, able to say that there were three, like there were three additional lights that are very dim. So that's the biggest, I think, challenge that we have to deal with is how do you model the, the amount of light that comes out from Milky Way and all the things that are nearby us? And how do we subtract them in a way that we still have information, but then we're able to go and count uh, these galaxies without any problem? Yeah. Definitely a problem. Um, let's see. I think you kind of touched on this question already, which is how do you measure the CMB lensing? Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, we have another question that is, in modern models, is ordinary dark matter considered regular matter? Um, no. So in modern models, like dark matter and regular matter, like these are still distinguished. Uh, regular matter is an easy way, like rule of thumb, I would say, is we also call it like 
luminous. So regular matter will interact not only with gravity, but it also interacts with electromagnetic force. So, uh, you know, like it, 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 like if you take two magnets, they will attract each other. Uh, or if you have like electricity, like you can convert electricity into also magnetism. So there are like, there's positive charge, negative charge, all of that. What we think the way that dark matter works is it only responds to gravitation and nothing else. So if you hold a magnet next to a clump of dark matter, it's not going to go anywhere. If you try to like shock it with electricity, it's not going to do anything. Um, if you try to heat it, it's not going to do anything. So um, which, which makes it, I think like a very puzzling thing is it doesn't behave like anything we know. Um, however, it seems to respond to gravitational effects. Which is also why, for example, like CMB lensing is a fun way to probe how much dark matter is there because light bends because due to the amount of matter and nothing else. So you have light, you might see a part of the sky where like there's no galaxy, but the light is still bending. And then you can infer, oh, it bended this much because there is probably this amount of dark matter present there. And from, from there, like we can try to start to make inferences of what's the percentage of dark matter uh, in the universe. Great. Uh, we had one um, just technical question. What's the YouTube YouTube channel called? It's the Mariah Mitchell YouTube, and I believe you can find links to it at the Mariah Mitchell website. Um, we also have a question um, that says, "Fabulous job." Is the rate of acceleration the same in all directions? That's a that's a great question, and that's something um, the the jargon we use is uh, isotropy, which means is the universe the same in all direction? So far, what the data suggests is yes, like that is how it works. Um, but if in the future we find any anomaly, I think that's going to be very exciting because that is one of the foundational assumptions uh, we make when we do cosmology is that the universe is isotropic. And so if it's no longer isotropic, half of our fundamental assumption is out of the window, uh, which I know will throw us into a crisis, but I also think that's an opportunity to do great science. So the answer is so far, we have not seen anything that says uh, the contrary, but who knows what the future might hold. Great. Um, let's see. Next question is, how will gravitational waves and experiments like LIGO contribute to measuring or refining the Hubble constant? How does this method compare to using DESI? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so there are a lot of uh, people within the LIGO collaboration who are looking at this question. So remember that I call this uh, the supernovae as like standard candle or standard bulb. Um, the people who are in working with gravitational waves, they have tried to come up with the analogous uh, idea, which is called a standard siren. Uh, in other words, if we sort of like know what the mass of let's say like the two objects that is giving rise to these gravitational uh, waves are, then we probably can uh, imagine like how loud, like how, like how much like there will be disruption in like the fabric of space time. And of course, like, like, uh, like uh, any ripple, like, like the ripple will kind of like slow uh, down over time, like, like the, the waves will become longer. So the idea is that like you can use this technique of standard siren, like you, you think you know how, how much, uh, how loud these uh, events would be. And by loud, I really don't mean like loud in physical sense, but loud in terms of like how much it moves the fabric of space itself. And so by comparing like those two numbers, you can then again start to like say like, what is the Hubble constant? So one, one interesting thing would be in the future as, as LIGO gets more refined is that that is another way of measuring how fast the universe is expanding. So when we try to combine all of these different ways, will we see that LIGO is finding a completely different value for the Hubble constant compared to Planck or the supernovae? Or will it be somewhere in the middle? Or will it agree with one over the other? And in any of those answers is interesting because then that tells us why is gravitational wave behaving similarly or dissimilarly from these other probes? So I think like that is another very exciting part of our uh, cos like cosmological analysis that is coming up like over the next decade. Very cool. That's awesome. 
Um, okay, the next question um, is from a, a friend or relative. It says, hi, Tanvir, this is Turag. Uh, wonderful presentation. Good to see you after so long. My question is, is there any newly discovered inclusion in the system, how it affects the earlier study of system, i.e. how the complete data set is affected slash modified? So um, if I uh, understand it correctly, I guess the, the question is that has there been any changes in the way, uh, like in our data set that is telling us like something else is um, happening? Well, I think the the, the biggest uh, inclusion would be the data set itself, or for example, the, the type of galaxies that I am using the emission line galaxies to study. Because as I mentioned, um, we don't really even understand like how like a lot of these like tracers, uh, like the, 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 the galaxies that I am using to measure uh, like create this 3D map of the universe behaves. Uh, it could be that these type of star forming galaxies at very early universe behaves very differently from star forming galaxies close to us. And we made a very bad assumption by assuming that they all behave the same way. So the, the short answer would be that is something we're actually looking at right now is that we are already collecting science verification data uh, where we, are, we have already collected uh, spectra of 100 of thousands of galaxies. And what we are doing is we're analyzing those data and trying to see, well, are things behaving the way that we expect them to, or do we already see some like anomaly which we need to account for? Uh, so that's like an ongoing research. So hopefully like next time I, I give a talk, like I'll probably have an answer for that. Great, that actually ties into another question that was asked, which is about the young galaxies. Um, did they always exist somewhere or how did they originate? Um, that's a that's a great question. So um, that also ties to the idea of like how matter gives rise to galaxies in the first place. So the very uh, like short answer is that we think the the matter is created in what we call the hierarchical formation. In other words, uh, at the beginning, like you had these like small clumps of matter that got together because of gravitation gravitational pull, and as time goes like smaller things come together and create bigger things. So at the very beginning, um, like there was no uh, galaxy because in order to have galaxy, you need to have stars. So stars did not start forming until, um, I guess in terms of like uh, time, probably like 11 to 12 billion years, that's like redshift, like six to um, eight is what we, we say that when like first stars are forming. So initially all you had were these Kind of like clumps of like dark matter roaming around the the universe and like amount of like regular matter and as time went on these like started to like come together uh and slowly like form the first stars and from there like we started to like form the, the galaxies and so forth great we have a couple more um let's see the next question is what is the equation you said that on a day-to-day -day basis you make a lot of tools for statistics, what type of tools do you make? Um, so uh, what we use is called, uh, let me just quickly go to that slide again. Um, yeah, so this is what is called a power spectrum. So um, if I, I will uh, try to explain this, uh, essentially, if you have uh, taken uh, some advanced math, you might have heard of the term like Fourier analysis. So what this, really means is that like, if I give you some um, arbitrary wave or some arbitrary uh, like mathematical function, you can try to like explain this as like sum of a lot of like sine and cosine waves. Like there is just like a, a very beautiful and elegant proof that shows you that like any uh, function you have can be expressed as sum of like many other sine and cosine waves. So what I do, is that like we look at the distribution of matter and we literally measure like how far, let's say one galaxy is away from another one. And this is what we call the correlation function. In other words, let's say like there, the distance between two galaxies are one megaparsec. What is the probability that like if there is a galaxy in point A, a one megaparsec away in point B, you will find another galaxy. So, um, we like take this function and then we run this type of like fancy Fourier analysis uh, because it turns out that in Fourier, uh, like when you think about things in terms of like Fourier analysis, 
you are able to figure out like what are the characteristic lengths, like length or uh, distances at which most galaxies reside very quickly. And so like using that, we are able to then like start like uh, testing our models. And this is essentially what happens over here is that we take like the power spectrum is that fancy Fourier transform of the correlation function that literally tells you how far things are. And so for, for example, here you see that this thing peaks around, you know, like this number 10 to the negative two. Um, so what this tells us is that like there is a, like you can convert this peak into a certain uh, epoch it back in time. Like let's say like, uh, a, like 10 billion or 11 billion years uh, ago. And this tells you like what was the last time when the amount of radiation in the universe was equal to the amount of matter. And if, if you know like uh, matter started dominating the universe much later then this peak would move like towards the right versus towards the left. And by like looking at like where the relative position is, we can like go and like make those calculations and say how things are. So this uh, line you see is sort of like my day-to-day -day work, like where I spend most of my time looking at these kind of plots. Great. Um, we have one more question, which is how can you tell what light is early universe versus more modern? Right, that's a, that's a great question. So um, this goes back to the uh let me see if i can find it right so the idea of um doppler shift so uh remember that what i said is that like if you have light in this like uh, what we call rest frame or the light that is static it's not moving it will appear normal but if it's you know like moving away from you then it's going to uh, look much redder so like how red something looks you can easily do that calculation. Like that's a function of its distance. So like the farther away something is, like the redder it looks because like the farther it's moving away, the faster it's moving away from us. So it turns out that the reason it's called the cosmic microwave background is because um, the light that you see that started from the very early universe, like by the time it, it arrived to us, entered like the microwave regime. So like the wavelength of this light is centimeters long. So if you then start observing, like set your telescope, well, you can't really use your normal optical telescope, but you need to use like some radio receiver at that, like, uh, like tune it to, let's say like a few centimeter, which corresponds to the microwaves. Um, actually, no, like microwave, that would be micrometers. Uh, so uh, so if, you, if you set it to like the, the micrometer level, uh, then you can actually start hearing like more and more noise. And I did not get into this, but that's actually the funny thing is how they discovered the CMB in the first place is because uh, in Bell Labs, they were trying to like build these big receivers and they happened to tune into that frequency and they kept hearing the same noise coming from everywhere. And they thought initially that was some radio station. They even thought it was like pigeon poop because they, they thought that maybe the heat of the, the pigeon poop corresponds to that, but they could not explain it away. And after a lot of thinking, like they were able to, like they spoke with some other theorists who were predicting that if Big Bang is true, we should be seeing some radiation at this microwave level. And then the observers spoke with the theorists and the rest is history. And so from there, uh, we, we were able to deduce that this is the earliest signal coming from the universe itself. Fantastic. Yes, the, um, the pigeon poop story is a great one. <laughs> um, so funny. Uh, I'm going to finish with one question of mine, um, which is what are your plans? What are your next big plans after you sort of finish up the, the PhD in the next year or so? Uh, yeah, so that's something I also ask myself. <laughs> uh, I think like it's uh, definitely... Uh, something that worry, uh, I think a lot of student, the grad students worry about uh, what the future will hold. So hopefully, if, like knock on wood, if everything works out well, um, I will be applying for a postdoctoral positions. So this is sort of like the next step one has to take uh, after grad school, but before getting a permanent uh, astronomy or research position. So you spend like a few years uh, learning like how to really be an independent researcher before making that next uh, step. So 
my hope is that I will go do that. Uh, but during the, the, that time, uh, Desi will be uh, completely operational, giving out exciting data. So I think it'll be a fun time to be able to run my own projects and see like what sort of like exciting science comes out of it. Definitely. And I can't wait to have you back um, as a speaker, hopefully in person and um, as an affiliated astronomer one day as well. I really am looking forward to that. So um, I think we don't have any more questions and we've gone quite a bit over time. So I'm probably going to um, close out for now. Um, and uh, I'd just like to thank you again so much. This was such an excellent talk and it was such a joy to have you back um, virtually. And um, from all of us at Mariah Mitchell, we want to say thank you and congratulations on your, your amazing career so far. And, you know, I really, really look forward to following along um, as it progresses. Thank so, you. <laughs> thank you very much. And for everyone out there, tune in again um, in two weeks um, for our next science speaker series. And you can register um, on our website. And um, thank you all and have a good night.